Hello and welcome to Below the Skyline on New Central Television. I am Dakbo Adigboye. The news at this time stats in West Africa where the United Nations says the second phase of the withdrawal of United Nations peacekeepers from Mali will be far more challenging than the first one. Our briefing reporters, the United Nations Special Representative to Mali, disclosed that the landlocked country is struggling with a surge of terrorist assault that she claims have damaged the region's infrastructure. The United Nations representative reaffirmed that the international organization is committed to taking all necessary steps to guarantee that the pullouts take place. And of course, staying in Africa, we understand that the uh, South, in South Africa, pathologist Dr. Johannes Stelnenkamp is at a stand in the Senzu Mayiwa trial today, focusing on injuries that led to the death of former Soka. The doctor told the court that the deceased secondary examination found that ECG stickers were situated to, on the chest of Mayiwa. This indicates that there was an attempt to resuscitate, which uh, would show the condition of the heart. He further explained that it indicates that the bullet tore through the heart, resulting in a tear in the right chamber of the heart, which pushes blood towards the lungs. It also partially tore the right coronary artery. Now, the doctor also added that the bullet also bruised the upper lobe of the lung and tore the lower lobe which caused bleeding. The father stated that Miyua survived seconds or even minutes after being shot, but definitely not hours, which is contradictory to the witness that we are in the house on the day of the shooting. Ben Malusi, a lawyer, joins me from Joburg, South Africa, to shed more light on this. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me, man. All right, so let's get straight to this. Can you just uh, give us a context of what the doctor said today at the continuation of the trial? A lot of it were quite technical for a layman, but uh, from what we gathered, it looks like the evidence from today is far different from what we've heard from witnesses who were in the house uh, that, of course, uh, the murder happened. So, thank you so much, man. I think this, this brings a tear to, um, to the people that were in court today uh, to actually hear how the deceased actually got wounded. It wasn't a very beautiful scene to, 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 to see that. But um, what we can gather here from what uh, Mr. Stienkamp said, just to help you with the pronunciation, it is Mr. Stienkamp. So what we, we've gathered there is that the, the gun shot was actually executed at a close range based on the fact that um, Senzo had, um, you know, abrasions and, and, and a burnt skin where um, the gun was actually uh, placed on his chest when he was shot. Now, indeed, it does bring a lot of aspersions now where to say, if we had to look at the case based on the people that were uh, are accused and um, that we have two accused, one tall, one short, the question that stands now is that the person that shot Senzo should have been at a level where they could have stood either at the same height as him, and based on the trajectory of the of the gun of the bullet, we hear that the, he was shot from the spleen, which is the top part of the chest, down towards um, the waist on the exit point, meaning the guy had to be tall. Now it brings contradiction to to accused number three who is said to have had the gun because he's a shorter fellow. Now, if it has to move and we have to give the gun to accused number two, which is a non-starter because he was not in a position of a gun based on the statements of the people that were in the house, it leaves us with one assumption to say, somebody in the house who had either the same height as Senzo or taller than Senzo might have pulled the trigger. Now, we understand that a ballistic expectation will take the stand tomorrow. Should we expect to hear a different testimony again or just to put you in the spotlight? What can we expect from, you know, the ballistic expert? It's very unfortunate that the ballistic expert is going to come and tell us what, what already is, is, is in contradiction to what happened into the, in the house. We already know that the gun in, in contention has been already uh, excluded from the crime scene by the previous um, 
investigating officer who has claimed and denied its existence within the crime scene based on the ballistic report that he received when he arrested accused number three. So the question that is going to be brought about now that's going to bring a lot of question is which gun is this that they're speaking about? Because the ballistic report that came out on the first gun that was uh, taken on the arrest of accused number three has proved not to be uh, involved in the, in the scene. So now the gun that is currently being brought and questionable the ballistic evidence is going to point to the gun and say, yes, this is the gun that was, um, this is the bullet, or this is the gun and the bullet, and they are in, in, in coercion, those two come out from the same spot. But the fact of the matter is that, is this the real bullet that actually was found on the scene, or was it placed in order to divert the gun that was actually in question? Looking at the also, the one thing that's also going to be a problem with this one here is to find out tomorrow from the ballistic evidence to say the lacerations that are, are caused into Senzo's wound, the direction of the wound, they need to match a 9 millimeter weapon based on the evidence that is currently being brought into court. And anything other than that would mean that is not the gun or that is not the caliber of weapon that was used to, 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 to deliver the fatal wound that killed Senzo. So we've got a problem. So we've studied a bit of, of um, the report. We've looked at um, the measurements and the, the sizes of bullets that go into each gun. And this particular bullet or this particular size, uh, presumptuously so, points in a direction of a 38 Special. All right. Now, now that the case, you know, is taking a different direction, uh, do you think that uh, this is the right time for the judge to bring in a docket 375? And if this happens, what are we? What are the implications of this particular docket? Yeah. So, so remember, in in, in the court of law, um, it is the state that has 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 what we call the dominus litis, which is the ownership. Of the case they own the case they own the the proceedings of this particular case now what they need to do now is uh, based on the evidence that is currently being given or currently presented in the court of law um, if there's any extracts by any chance that lead to either the defense or the state going to make reference in the docket 375 it is then by default that the docket needs to be brought into contention, either by a way of joinder or by the way of allowing this case to go to the end and then restarting a case 375 based on if the judge is going to come and say, I'm giving all the witnesses, or sorry, all the accused, a 174, uh, section 174, which is a discharge from the offense of murder. Um, and therefore, there's nobody that has been found guilty from the people that have been presented to me as the court of law. Therefore, it opens up a case to say there is a docket which is also still outstanding, which is 375, that needs to be uh, taken into its full process of the law. Then everybody that was a witness in this case becomes a suspect. All right. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. Have a great day.